So let me, let me talk to you about this uh, for a few minutes this morning, this message. And I want to start in Matthew 28, verse 19. And then we'll read Luke chapter 3, verse 21. And I forgot my Bible, so I'm going to use Olin's Bible today. This, I found a Bible back there that said, for the, for the seeing impaired or something like that. So I thought, that's the one, that's the one I need. I think it's, I'm paraphrasing. That's not what it said. It's seeing challenged or something. I can't remember. That was, the, that was my NIV translation there. But uh, in Matthew 28, in verse 19 and 20, and then we're going to read the fascinating verse, the wonderful verse about Jesus in Luke 3, 21 and 22. And I just titled this Believer's Baptism. Now, now think about this, really. Look at me. When's the last time you heard a message on water baptism? There, listen, there's been a, a sad, listen, there's been a sad lack of emphasis on something that is, that is very important in the Christian life. And you're going to see that today. And uh, I want to call this believer's baptism. That's what water baptism is. It is the believer's baptism. It is the believer's confession of faith in Jesus Christ. And it is prolific throughout the word of God. Matthew 28, 19. This is the command of our Lord. Go, go therefore and make disciples. Do you, do you know where the verb is in this sentence? The verb is not on go. It looked like it would be in go. The verb is on, the, the verb is on make disciples. We've got to be active making disciples. Not, listen, not just church members, not just attendees. But a disciple is a follower. So it's a committed follower, Jesus Christ. He said here, he's gonna, I'm going to read. He said, every, teach them everything I've commanded you. No, it's a deep, it's a, it's a committed follower of Jesus. And that's what we want in our church. We want to become more committed to Christ every day. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. Come on, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Amen. It's a command. Now, Luke 3, 21 and 22, we find Jesus. Let's behold Jesus. We've been talking a lot about Jesus. I can't, preaching is proclaiming Jesus. That's what the gospel is. So we proclaim Christ today. We always proclaim Christ And here we find Christ. We find our Lord. He's about 30 years of age. And here he is. He's standing on the river's banks of Jordan. We were baptized in the Jordan. I've been baptized in Jordan twice. If I go again, I'm going to do it again and again and again. Now, you don't need to do it but once. But but it's just just something about being baptized where Jesus was baptized. It was amazing. And here we see Jesus. Look at it. When all the people were baptized... It came to pass, Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice from heaven came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Amen. Believers, baptism. Baptism in water is is believers, believers' baptism. You know what you have? You know what you have when you hold a Bible in your hand? If you have a Bible there, I know we use a lot of the screen stuff today, and that's fine, great. But hold hold your Bible up. You know what you have when you have a Bible? You have a wet book. And you know know why? Because if you take all the references to water out of this book, you'd have a dry book. But we don't have a dry book, do we? This is a live book. This is a book that's wet. But have you noticed how much great importance the Scripture places on baptism and, and, and things of water. I found, as I began to look at this, this subject of water baptism and believer's baptism, one of the things that the Lord refreshed my mind, it really reminded me, is how much he uses water to teach spiritual lessons. I mean, in this Bible, there are seas and brooks and wells and fountains and rivers. There's springs, there's pools, and there's clouds. In the Bible, water speaks of the word of God, the washing of the water by the word, right? The Holy Spirit is a water, is a type of the Holy Spirit and dew. Do you know your salvation? He said you'll draw out of the wells of salvation with joy. Have you ever noticed how many miracles are connected with water in the scripture? 
Have you ever noticed that the water flowed from the rock? Have you noticed that Jesus walked on the water? Naaman dipped seven times in Jordan's waters. The axe had floated on the waters. Moses stretches out his hand and he divided the waters. The blind man was told, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Remember when Jesus turned the what? The water into wine. The Bible said the fire came from heaven and licked up the water that was on Elijah's sacrifice. The Lord spoke to Israel and said, if you'll dig trenches, I'll fill them up. And the, he filled them up with water and the enemy saw it as blood. You're, you're, that's a wet book right here. There's a lot that has to do with water in the word of God. But today we're talking about believers' baptism. What is, what is water baptism? Basically, it's this, just a proper definition. Water baptism is, is an outward religious ceremony which represents something that's happened to someone inwardly, spiritually. We, we could say it this way. It's a washing with water which symbolizes the cleansing of the believer from the stains of sin. Baptism is always associated with repentance of sins and believing the gospel and becoming a member of the body of Christ. It's believer's baptism. First of all, let's look at the pattern of scripture. You ever find patterns in the word of God? You look for patterns and look for things. Water is used a lot, as I've said, but the foundation of New Testament water baptism is really rooted in Judaistic washings. They were always washing. They must have been the cleanest nation on the face of the earth. They were constantly washing, washing, washing. I'll read a verse in a minute, minute about the Pharisees. But we were, uh, we were in Qumran, and maybe they'll have this, they'll put this up. We were in Qumran, and we went to Qumran, and you know what we found there? There was all these pools that were there, pools everywhere. And we began to study about the ASEANs. And, and by the way, just, just re, John the Baptist could have been a part of this ASEAN group, this washing group. Uh, certainly Jesus was aware of them. There's no record of it. But Jesus sure, surely had to be aware of these people. The ASEAN group around started about 130 B.C. And it went to like the second century. So you see one of these pictures. This is one of the pools that we, that we saw there. This washing. And what we know is this. Here's, here's what we know about the, the Essenes. Here's what it says about them. They practiced strict ritual purity. They washed daily, really. They practiced continual worship. They, they were constantly studying the Hebrew scriptures, constantly praying, and constantly praying. They were like this separatist group. The temple, the priesthood at the temple had become corrupt, and so they moved down by the Dead Sea and started this Qumran community, kind of as their protest. And one of the things they did constantly was this washing, washing, and you can see this pool here. They, 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 this is really what the Old Testament scriptures, there's a lot of washing. Even, even verses like this, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, 20, 21, who formerly, uh, Peter said, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in, a, in which a few, eight souls, now notice this, were saved through water. Look at that. Now, this is way back, this is referring way back into Genesis 9. They were saved through water. Then this also is an antitype which now saves us. Notice this, which now saves us baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, when it says there, saved through baptism, it's not saying that the water saves you. How many know Jesus went through a baptism? Jesus went through a baptism of death. He was buried down in the grave. And through his baptism of suffering, which we identify with, that's what saves us. How many know Jesus is the one who saves us? So it's sad today there's so much lack of emphasis placed upon water baptism. But, but notice this, in the Old Testament, water, this ritual washing had to do with ritual purity. Now notice the, the, that water in the Old Testament was ritual. It was symbolic. It couldn't really do what the blood can do for us today, but it pointed to that. No, notice this, this water symbolizes spiritual cleansing. Here's Aaron as his sons. When they would go in to minister in the, the holy place and they would do their daily work. There's something they had to do. They had to wash in this piece of furniture called the laver. 
It was so important. Notice what it says here. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. And then it says, verse 20, and they shall go into the tabernacle of meeting when they go there, when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water. How serious was it? Lest they die. Hey, Aaron, you better stay clean or you're going to die. But actually here, this has tremendous significance because here's what, if we don't wash, we will die. People are dying spiritually because they're not washed in the blood of Jesus. Do you see it there? God used Israel as a prophetic picture of spiritual things. Hebrews talks about this washing. See, this baptism is rooted in this washing, and we're going to get to that. Now, notice Hebrews 10. Let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance, having our hearts, notice, sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So what the Old Testament taught with this washing was this. You can't enter the presence of God unless you're washed, unless you're cleansed. How many know no sin will ever get in the presence of the Lord? We have to be washed. You want to get in the presence of the Lord? The Bible says in 1 John, he doesn't fellowship in the darkness, but he fellowships in the light. He fellowships in the purity, in the righteousness, and we get that righteousness from him. Can't enter his presence unless we're washed. Unless we're clean, we have to be sprinkled. We have to be cleansed. Now, that in the Old Testament was was ceremonial, but ours is a true cleansing. And then we see prophecies about this water and this that the Lord would send. Zechariah thirteen says, "In that day, a fountain shall be opened." Notice that the, Zechari- the fountain—that's water. The fountain's going to be open, and shall be open for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. No, notice. For sin and for cleansing. What's he talking about? What's what's Zechariah talking about? He's not talking about physical water. He's talking about what the physical water pointed to do. And that was the blood that would wash away our sins. Remember what John said? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. And you remember that song. There's what can wash away my sins. What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You remember that song? There is a fountain filled with blood. Come on, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath its flow, lose all their guilt and their stain. So we see here this prophecy. We see this ritual cleansing. This is where water baptism, believer's baptism, is rooted in. Jesus Jesus talked to the Pharisees and confronted them. And it says, look at this verse in Mark 7. Look at this verse. He says, Jesus says, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash. Wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things. Jesus talking here. They do many other things which they have received and hold like, like the washing of cups and picture, pictures, copper vessels, and couches. Now, I don't know how you wash a couch, but anyway, I guess it's, uh, anyway. This washing here has to do with, with the word baptism, to immerse, to wash something, to dip, to dip something down. It's back where we get washing. The problem with the Pharisees was that those washings were ceremonial, and the Lord meant it to be more than a ceremonial washing he meant, it, he meant it to point to something that needs to change on the inside. And you remember John the Baptist. He had a baptism. He had a washing. And what he would do, people would come to him, and, and what they were doing is confessing their sins. So, so when, when those, that multitude, that revival that was happening to prepare for the coming of Jesus, that baptism was people going out. And when you, listen, when you went to John's baptism, what you were actually confessing is, I need cleansing. In fact, the evidence is that John the Baptist would not baptize anyone in water unless they would confess their sins. Can you imagine if we, we did this today? Okay, I'm going to baptize you, Jeremy. Okay, now you've got to confess all your sins to everyone. And you, no, I can't do it, Pastor. Sorry. All right? That's kind of how it was. Listen to it here. It says, Matthew 5. 
Then Jerusalem and Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. That's what they were saying. Lord, forgive me for lying. I'm confessing my sin. I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. I'm a scoundrel, whatever. They were confessing their sins publicly and being baptized. It says, but when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. You know what that tells me? That tells me baptize, bapt, being baptized in water without repentance means nothing. There has to come the corresponding spiritual work that God does in the heart. He said, do not say that, you know, Abraham, you know, you can't say that, that you were, we're Abraham's children. God's able to raise children up from the stones. Look at verse 11. John said, indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who comes after me, who's mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, he shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit, and he shall baptize you with fire. Paul comes to Ephesus in Acts 19, and here's what he says. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? They said, we have not so much heard if there be a Holy Spirit. Then he says, well, what baptism were you baptized by? They said, we were baptized at the revival, at John's revival, at, the, at John's baptism. And he said, well, well, that baptism was to point to Jesus, the one who was going to come. It was, bapti it was baptized unto repentance. In other words, you were being baptized that baptism didn't forgive you. John couldn't forgive anyone, certainly, but it was baptized, baptized unto forgiveness. In other words, it was baptism, faith in Jesus. And so the Bible says, he said, well, you haven't had Christian baptism. But he said, so he said, he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then what did he do? He laid hands on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Isn't that interesting? But we have this background of water baptism, rooted in the washings and the baptisms of the Old Testament. And that's the, that's the background. That is the, if you will, that's the pattern that we see in the Old Testament. So, so let's answer this question. What does the Bible really teach about Christian baptism? What does the Bible teach about New Testament baptism? Well, as I said, the Lord left two ordinances for the church. Can someone name those two ordinances? What are the two ordinances that Jesus left his church? Communion, so the Lord's table, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And the other one is what? It's water baptism. Those are the two ordinances that Jesus said that we're to be doing until he comes. That's one of the two. So here's some, here's some principles of water baptism, a couple, a few of them. One is this, when the Lord sends his ministers, he sends them to preach. He sends them to proclaim the gospel, but listen, but to also baptize in water. He sends them to preach and to baptize in water. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Next verse says, and he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. When the preachers go, they go and preach to every creature, offering salvation to every creature through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But also they are to be baptizing in water. It's the text we read. Go therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What did Ananias do when Ananias went and saw, go, go, Ananias, there's a man named Saul down here. I want you to go. No, I don't want anything to do with that man. He, he persecutes the church. He incarcerates Christians. Oh, listen, Ananias, he's a chosen vessel of mine. He goes in and says, brother Saul, he, Saul had been smitten blinded by the Lord. They're like scales upon his eyes. Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to pray over you and, to, and to, to, that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. He laid hands on him. The blinders miraculously fell off. That's a miracle. And, all, and then he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. I believe, I believe he spoke with tongues because in Corinthians he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. He was a southerner. And then it says this here. It says here, he said, and it, he, once he received his sight and he arose and was baptized. Think about it. What, what did Paul do when he went to Philippi? The, the Philippian jail situation. The Lord lets him and Silas out of the Philippian jail. And what did the jailer say? What must I do to be saved? 
And then what, what does it say they did? It says, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. You hear this? That the, the principle of this, ministers are to be going forth into all the world, proclaiming the gospel, preaching, but also baptizing. Now, notice this second principle, and that's this. Baptism is always linked with repentance, always. Baptism without repentance is nothing. It's empty ritual. What did Peter say on Pentecost? Repent, every one of you, and what? Be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Can I hear an amen? Come on. Notice notice with me. Uh, Here's the third principle, and that's this. Baptism always, everyone say always, always always follows the decision to believe. See, think about the New Testament teaching of Scripture knows absolutely nothing about unbaptized believers. We have a lot of that goes on in this day. Nobody knew about that in the, in the New Testament. They were all baptized. No, notice this, Acts 2.41. It says, and those who gladly received the word, that's the word of salvation, they were saved. It says, they were, what, baptized. Notice Acts 18 and 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and all of his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed and were baptized. Notice this, Acts 8. It says, and they believed Philip, and, and as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Simon also believed, and when he, and he was baptized, continued with them. The New Testament knows nothing about unbaptized believers. Those who received the word of God were baptized. Those that were repenting were baptized. They were connected together. So what about the practice? How do we practice baptism? How do we, how do we, what are the practicalities of baptism? Well, we practice the Trinitarian baptism. Jesus gave us, I believe, the formula. Now, I'm not stuck on formulas, but Jesus gave us the formula. And you know what the formula is? We found it in Matthew 28. We baptize them under Trinitarian Baptism, and that's this. We baptize in the name of the Father. Everybody say it with me. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why, why do we do that? Why do we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And the reason we do is because those are the words of Jesus. That's the command that Jesus gave. Go and baptize this way in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Baptize that way. Now, we know that in Acts they don't always use that formula. It doesn't state. It, it says in, in many places, like, like for instance, Acts 19.5, and when they heard, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Doesn't say anything about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord. There again, not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 16.8.16, 8, uh, 8, it says, Holy Spirit had not fallen on them. They only had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 1048 of Acts, and they commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and asked them to stay with them a few days. So why is that? Why, why are those verses like that in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, why does it say Father, Son, Holy Spirit? I simply, I believe it's a very simple answer and I believe it's this. Those are not formulas. Those are just a general way of saying these experience Christian baptism. But the formula is in Matthew 28, does that make sense? That when it says they were baptized in the name of Jesus, they said they submitted to Christian baptism. Now they're following Jesus. But we have the formula in Matthew 28. So we practice, what do we practice? We practice the Trinitarian form of baptism. And then another thing we practice, we don't sprinkle. Now you go outside and get sprinkled. Some churches sprinkle. We're not sprinklers. We baptize. We, we immerse we, immerse, we don't baptize babies. We don't even sprinkle babies. We dedicate babies because we see that in Scripture. But what we do is we, we, we immerse, and, and really the word baptism has to do, do with the immersion, has to do with dipping down. But the reason that we practice immersion is because this is what the epistles teach. Notice this great verse. Put this verse up, the Romans 6, 4. Look at this. Here's what it says. Therefore... We were, say it with me, we were buried. Now notice, we were not dipped. 
Now, I know this is spiritual here, but this is the, the spiritual action describing salvation. And on the old man, it says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Why, do we, why are we going to dip these guys down? And if one toe comes up and doesn't get wet, I'm pushing it down. All right? I don't know how much water's back there, but if an L, I'm, we're going we're to get you down, guys, okay? Why? Because notice it says buried. The old man needs to be buried. It symbolizes that. Notice this. Remember, remember when the Lord told Philip to leave the great revival, and he said, go down to Gaza, which is desert. And he certainly probably didn't know. The Lord just gave him that, that word, go. The angels, Go. And he goes down there, and all of a sudden, there's a chariot, and there's an Ethiopian man. And in ancient days, they would read out loud. And he could hear the man reading out loud. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah in Isaiah 53. And, and Philip just says to him, sir, do you, know what you're, you understand what you're reading? How can I know this unless somebody tells me, explains this to me? And Philip said, hey, let, let, me, let me ride with you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you who this is talking about. This is talking about Jesus. And he began to share Jesus. And certainly we get the impression that he talked about baptism. And he said, well, hey, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Basically, I, I trust Jesus as my Savior. I believe that he is Savior. I confess him. I accept him. Here's water. Now, this is awesome. This is great. I mean, oh, the Lord is so exciting. And he went down. It says, it says here, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. That word baptized means immersion. He immersed him down in the water. And the word of God says, when they came up out of the water, Philip was caught away. Now it's hard to believe, but it's like pew, he's disappeared. And if you study, uh, geography, he's about, he, he appeared 20 miles away. I hope we get to do that when we get our new bodies. Go and golfing, Missy. Pew. I'm there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, Joe, go get some milk. I'm back already. Hey, what you doing there? Wouldn't that be great? But that was a miracle. Read that story in Acts chapter 8. But he baptized him down. That's the principles. Now, quickly, what about the picture? Why should we be baptized? Why should Jeremy be baptized? Why should Robert be baptized? Why should you and I be baptized? How many of you remember when you were baptized in water? I remember, I remember exactly what the preacher, he baptized me in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. I think I was in the water when he said that. I hope he did. But when he came back out, I remember he said, here's my Holy Ghost man. That's what he said. But notice the picture. Here's why you brethren should be baptized. Here's why all of us should be, go down in the waters of believers' baptism. And that is because when we do that, do you realize we're identifying with Jesus? We're identifying with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. See, when I follow Jesus into the waters and submit to believer's baptism, what happens, I am, I am identifying with the atoning work of Jesus for my soul. Water baptism, listen, is about death. That's what the water is. The water is a grave. Water is about death. Jesus said this in Luke 12. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed that I am. Until it is accomplished. What was Jesus talking about? He wasn't talking about water baptism. That happened when he was 30 years old. This is like three and a half years later. What's he, what baptism is he talking about? And by the way, there's more than one baptism. Did you know that? Baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit, baptism in the body of Christ. And here, Jesus is talking about the baptism of suffering that he will suffer and he will be buried in the grave. He'll suffer as he takes our sins on his cross and he said, I'm going to have this. And now we know it was suffering he's talking about. We know it's death that he's heading toward. You say, how do I know that? Because in Mark 10, he asked this question. Jesus said to them, do you, know, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drank? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, we are able. Jesus said, you're indeed going to drink that cup. And you're indeed going to experience that baptism. In other words, you're going to experience that suffering. So when we go down, down, down into the waters, into the grave, 
of believer's baptism. We are identifying with his suffering. He took my sins there. I'm buried there with him. I identify with him. But we're also not only with his death, but his burial and his resurrection. I mean, no, uh, now, uh, uh, you know, some folks need to be held down a little longer. I understand that. I'm not going to hold you down long. Okay, but, but what happens is we go down because that's the old life. It's gone. It's down. That old life is gone. Come on. Sins are gone. Bondages are gone. Uh, hell is gone. Judgment is gone. Wrath is not on me anymore. But we got to come back out, and we come back out in resurrection power. Come on. We come back out in new life. That's what baptism is about. Notice this. It's about the death, but also the, the burial and the resurrection. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Put this up. Oh, I love this verse. Do you not know? Now, I ask Trinity Life Church. Do you not know that as many of, of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? That's the death part. We go down in the waters. But notice, therefore, we were buried, we were buried with him through the baptism in to death. Now, now, here's the good part. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See, we go down and our sins are forgiven and buried forever in a sea of forgetfulness. Jesus took those, but we come back out and we're, right, we're ready to live for God now. We, we have resurrection life inside of us and we're going to live for him. So, so we identify. That's what happens. We identify with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Here's another reason the, the, what the picture is and why we should be baptized has to do with commitment. Baptism symbolizes a lifelong commitment of dying to sin, battling sin, battling the enemy, battling those things of, of, that, that try to come back in. It symbolizes commitment. Notice again that we should walk in newness of life. We're buried so we can come back up. And what? Walk in newness of life. That life is not always easy, by the way. That life's hard sometimes. It's not, it's not easy to live for the Lord. We've got to, but, but our baptismal commitment is saying, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to battle the devil. I'm going to die to my old self. John, or Paul said it again here. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. That's the old life. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body, you're going to live. All right? Here's another reason you should be baptized. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. And that's because of the deeper life. I just touch on this. Maybe I could preach a whole message on this. Do you realize that water baptism pictures another baptism? Did you realize that water baptism pictures another baptism? Connected again and again and again. Water baptism symbolizes baptism in the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. Notice this. I, indeed, John said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You see that? Jesus said, Acts 1, 5, for John truly baptized you with water, but you disciples shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Here's what, here's what I, I believe. Every believer should follow the Lord in believer's baptism, but every believer should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized in water. But the baptism in water isn't, okay, it's done. The baptism in water is to lead me into a deeper work of the Holy Ghost. Come on. There's more. And, he, and then they received it on the day of Pentecost, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Hallelujah. Notice how water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit is connected. Again and again through Scripture. It's not separated Notice Acts 11, verse 16. Peter's explaining he's gone into the house of a Gentile. The church at Jerusalem heard about it. They said, you know, why are you doing that? You're not supposed to do that. And he said, well, listen what God did. Here's how he explains it. As I began to speak to Cornelius and those guys, the Holy Spirit fell. As it upon us in the beginning. Then I remember the word of the Lord. John indeed baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized in water. I mean, no, God can, God can get the order like he wants it. 
Why should I be baptized? I should be baptized because I identify with Jesus, because it's a baptismal commitment, because of the deeper work of the Holy Spirit, but also for the body of Christ. When I'm baptized in water, it's symbolical that I am united with the body of Christ. I'm a part of the baptized believers in the Lord. Corinthians says this, for by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. We've, Jews are Greek, slave free. We've all been made to drink of one spirit. Baptism unites me to the body. Ephesians says this, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Therefore, there is one body, one spirit, just as you're called to one hope and one calling, one faith, and one baptism. There's one baptism. We all go through the waters of baptism. I close with this. The power, the practice, the, the principles, the picture. What about the power Water baptism, the power. Now, here's the question. Is water baptism, is there, is there any spiritual grace in water baptism? Or is, is it just an empty rite, an empty ceremony? Now, think about that question because people fall on both sides of this. Some people say, no, water baptism, it's just water. It's, there's nothing to it. It's just a ceremony. There's people on the other extreme that said, no, 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 water saves you. In other words, they say, you're not saved until you go down into the water. Well, I can tell you this, water can't save you. Water baptism, a ceremony, cannot save you. But to simply say that it's an empty ritual is to not really look at Scripture. Now, we certainly don't believe the water baptism saved, certainly don't believe in baptismal regeneration, but I certainly also don't believe that it's an empty ritual. Why? Because have you noticed in Scripture how present the Holy Spirit is in baptism? Have you noticed it? Have you noticed that the Lord is present in many baptisms? God's doing supernatural things when people, sometimes it proceeds, sometimes it follows, sometimes it's during, even our Lord, certainly he's the Lord, he's the Savior, But yet at his baptism, the Holy Spirit was there descending. The Father was speaking. There was the pleasure of the Lord that was there. Even at the great Samaritan revival, they're believing the gospel. And it says here, when they were baptized, they were amazed at the miracles and the signs that were taking place. And then it even says that they'd been baptized in water, but John and Peter and John came down from Samaria, uh, from Jerusalem and said they, they, they'd received Christ. They'd been baptized in water. Absolutely, they were saved. They had not received the Holy Spirit. It's very clear. For, the, for yet the, the Holy Spirit had fallen on none of them. I mean, notice, demons are being cast out. Miracles are taking place. They're baptized in water. They're confessing Christ. They're believing the message. But it says clearly, the Holy Spirit had not fallen on them. And it says here, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Think about it. So, why should I be baptized? Because I'm, I'm following Jesus and all New Testament believers from, from all time. I, I want to submit to believers' baptism because I want to obey the clear clear command of scripture of our Lord I want to show the world I've I've broken with sin and my my old life is gone we're not the same people we used to be old things are passed away all things become new we're done with the sinning business we've got new life I want to testify to the world that Jesus is Lord and I want to identify with Christ and I want to identify with his body amen I want you guys to go get ready, and uh, if, you could, if you go to the back and get ready, I want us to all stand. If we could have some musicians join me here. We're going to conclude this service today with water baptism, believer's baptism. Hallelujah. Believer's baptism. This is really just like marriage is a sermon. Water baptism is an illustrated sermon. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you just pray with me? Would you bow your heads for a moment? Thank you, Lord. 
We bless your name, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this teaching today on water baptism. Lord, we, we see all this washing. Water, water, water. Everywhere in the Bible, there's water. Jesus, out of your belly shall flow rivers of water. Rivers of living water. You said we'll draw out of the wells with salvation, with joy. Those wells of water. Jesus said to the lady, if you drink of this water, you're thirsty again. You drink of the water I give. You'll never thirst again. So much water. Lord, it just shows us we need washing, but we also need refreshing. Lord, you know everything your people need today. Help us to, Lord, help us to remember our baptismal commitment. That day that we said yes to Jesus. We committed to following you all the days of our life. Strengthen our commitment today. Fill us with your presence. Why don't you just lift your hands right now? Everyone just say, Lord, fill me fresh and anew with your presence. Come on, would you do that? Come on. Come on, I shouldn't have to prime anyone. Just ask the Lord to fill this whole church with his presence. Lord, fill us with power today. Fill us with the anointing today. Fill us with the fire of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, burning out the chaff, burning out the dross. Fill us today. We worship you, O oh God. We bless your name. Hallelujah. 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 Fill us with your power. Lord, we see that baptism in waters connect with the baptism in the Spirit. And Lord, baptism in water should lead us to deeper life. We want more of your presence. We need more of your grace. Lord, your word says that grace be multiplied. May your grace be multiplied to us today. Some of you need a fresh touch of Holy Spirit life. Some of you need to be filled. Let the Lord feel you right there where you are. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Break forth into worship and praise. Allow the Spirit of the Lord to have His way in you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We bless your great name. We worship your awesome and wonderful name. Hallelujah. Stephanie, could you come and lead us in the chorus? And let's worship and let's thank Him that we've identified with the burial. How many know our sins are gone? Come on, amen. Your sins are gone. You may remember them. The Lord's not going to remember them anymore. They're all gone. Hallelujah. They're gone. The tape, but listen, the tape has been erased. Come on, somebody shout amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Come on, let's lift our hands and praise Him.